Hello everybody, I'm David, part of the Australian Student Christian Movement. Uh, we're here with Associate Professor Jeff Jin, who's going to talk to us about a very interesting religious community. Before we do that, just want to acknowledge the lands in which we are meeting, acknowledge our uh, Indigenous uh, elders, past, present and emerging. Now, for those of you, especially in Queensland, you would know about or may know about the medieval festival that happens every year and actually is going to be happening uh, quite soon, next month. But what I didn't know about is this religious community that is there and has been there for quite some time. And you can thank them for the festival. Uh, and their history goes back decades in this country and overseas. Associate Professor, can you tell us about this community? What is this community? Thank you, David. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk about it. I find it a fascinating subject and I'm always willing to kind of share my thoughts and, um, and research. Um, the community is known as the Confraternity of the Kingdom of Christ, um, and it was established at that site in 1965, having previously been in New South Wales and Sydney, and before that in the United Kingdom and also in Cyprus. So it's a community that uh, is organised on uh, communal grounds, as you'd expect. It's a, it's a religious community on the style of a medieval um, abbey. Uh, so that's why it's the abbey medieval festival. It's the Abbey Museum and the festival is held to raise funds for the Abbey Museum. Um, so in a way, it's a kind of an interesting anomaly because, you know, Caboolture is not a place where you expect to find a medieval community, you know, a neo-medieval community. Um, so I first started researching it through a, uh, a relationship I had with Michael Strong. He and I worked together in the cultural heritage field in the 1990s. And Michael Strong uh, grew up in that community. His parents joined it in the 1940s. Uh, and in fact, uh, Michael was the founder of the Abbey Museum when it was established in 1986. So for many years, the Abbey community at Caboolture had had a collection of artefacts and antiquities, a very valuable collection uh, that they'd brought with them from the UK and from Cyprus and when they arrived here in, in Queensland. So the story of the Abbey Museum is closely linked with this story of the confraternity of the Kingdom of Christ. Um, and I, I wrote a book about the founder of that community in, uh, it was published in the UK in 2012. Uh, so this is a man by the name of John Ward. Uh, his full name is John Sebastian Marlow Ward. So if you Google JSM Ward, you'll see an enormous amount of stuff on the internet about him. Most of it not very accurate, most of it quite melodramatic. Um, but if you like, I can launch into the story of, of John Ward as the founder of the Abbey community and also the founder of this collection that is now on display there at the Abbey Museum. Yeah, that'd, that'd be great. Yeah, happy to do that. So John Ward was born in Belize in uh, British Honduras, you know, in, in, in the 1880s. He was born in 1885. But the family returned to Britain, uh, where he grew up uh, as, a, as a, you know, a boy and a young man in London. So his father was a clergyman in West London. He had a very conventional upbringing. But he also started to experience some interesting anomalous, uh, what you might call psychic or clairvoyant experiences as a young man. So in a way, he's an interesting combination between a very conventional kind of high church Anglicanism on the one hand, and what we might describe as a more esoteric form of Christianity inspired and infused by uh, spiritualism on the other. So he felt that he was psychic, he was clairvoyant. Um, along the way, he also um, uh, studied history at Cambridge. So he graduated from Cambridge University in uh, 1908 uh, with a degree in history. Uh, he worked as a school teacher in Britain. He uh, then uh, worked as the diocesan headmaster at the school, uh, the, the, the headmaster of the diocesan school in Rangoon in Burma, which was then a British colony. Um, and along the way, he had a massive interest in antiquities and collecting. So from the time he was 10 years old, he was collecting artifacts and objects and things that he found interesting. And that included things like archaeological. Uh, fragments. He'd go to building sites, you know, in, in, in London, and he'd, he'd find pieces of Roman pottery and so on. Um, but also uh, Paleolithic stone tools, you know, flints and so on. And he'd also, uh, as he got older, was interested in artwork, uh, in ceramics. Uh, he was interested in weapons. Uh, he had a collection that included things, you know, like um, uh, religious uh, implements from, uh, from Tibetan Buddhism, from uh, Hinduism, you know, statues of Hindu gods and so on. So as, as time went on, he developed this extraordinarily collective, eclectic collection. Um, and I think he had this total fascination with history and with the evidence of history. And over time, he becomes more and more interested in the cycles of history and kind of the meaning, the cosmic meaning of history. 
Uh, so for him, history is kind of like a revelation. And as you study it, you find this unfolding story of human spiritual evolution. That's, that's how he understood the, the great patterns of human history. He's also a Freemason, uh, which is another dimension to the story that's really interesting. He's an extremely enthusiastic Freemason when he was a young man at Cambridge. And then when he was living in Rangoon in Burma, he continued to be a member of various Masonic lodges there. And he had this, what he described as an anthropological interest in Freemasonry, uh, in the sense that he saw Freemasonry as a survival of an ancient universal tradition of mystical wisdom. You know, it wasn't necessarily a religion in itself, but he saw it as an ancient survival uh, of the great mysteries of life and death and the afterlife. And he believed fundamentally in the kind of Hindu notion of karma and reincarnation. You know, he believed that human beings, their soul went through multiple incarnations and along the way they developed spiritual insight. And so for Ward, the really interesting kind of combination for him is he's a high church Anglican on the one hand, really interested in history and church heritage, the importance of institutions and you know, and things like, you know, priests and bishops and, 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 and historical hierarchies. But at the same time, he's quite unusual amongst Anglicans in that he's a firm believer in reincarnation and in, in spirit communication, in, in, in spiritualism. Um, so they sort of come together in Freemasonry, but then over time, his uh, visions, if you want to call that, which start off as kind of spirit testimony, um, become more explicitly religious. So in 1916, he came back to, to England from Burma. Uh, he, uh, his brother had been killed on the Western Front. Uh, his father-in-law had passed away in 1913. And so Ward's spirit communications were very much about communicating messages from his uh, deceased brother and father-in-law to explain the nature of the afterlife. And that was a very common theme in spiritualism at that time is, you know, spirit communications could provide people with insights into the meaning of life after death and the reality of you know, higher life. Um, so Ward is a, is a wartime spiritualist in that sense, but his religious insights, I suppose you'd call them, his, well, we, you know, modern researchers describe these as anomalous experiences. You know, he's, he's got a, he's a, he's a perfectly sane, perfectly functioning individual. Uh, he works as a school teacher. He then works as an economic analyst for the Federation of British Industries. He's a perfectly sane and normal person to talk to. Uh, he's able to organise his everyday life, he pays his bills, you know, he's perfect, perfectly, you know, mentally capable, but he's having anomalous psychic experiences. And that's described in the literature as, you know, as literally anomalous experiences. And that includes voices and visions and so on. And so he's writing down these voices and visions. Um, and he, uh, to him, they make increasing sense as a preparation, uh, in, in a sense that he had a, a divine communication from a an entity that he regarded as a, as a spirit, you know, an advanced spirit from, um, from the afterlife, uh, from the higher planes of human existence, uh, who was calling upon him to prepare for religious work in, in Britain. So this is where his story becomes, in a way, kind of apocalyptic, because he starts to prepare for the second return of Christ, along with his, uh, his wife, Jessie, uh, Jessie Ward. Uh, and in the late 1920s, he does a series of public talks, and it talks about uh, the divine guidance that he had received, that he felt he had received, and he felt that he and his wife had been called upon to prepare for the, 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 the divine advent, the return to Christ, uh, the return of Christ to earth. And they felt that Christ would come to earth as a king, literally as a crowned king, you know, in, 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 in one of the royal families of, of Europe. And of course, he um, put two and two together. And his thinking was that this was going to be a British thing, right, a British empire, that literally Christ was going to return in order to carry forward the if, uh, the evolutionary role of the, as he saw it, of the of, of British civilization on the world stage. So it's a very interesting mix in the 1930s. Uh, uh, esoteric Christianity on the one hand, spiritualism on the other, uh, Adventist teachings and an Adventist calling. And so when he gives these public lectures, people actually come along and listen, and a number of people joined him. And that's when they established the Abbey in London in 1930. Uh, they bought a property in the northern part of London. Uh, they all moved there as a community. They all took names in religion. So each of them would take a Latin title. Um, so for instance, uh, a fellow that joined in Colin Chamberlain, he took the name Phileas Domini. Um, uh, you know, uh, Ward himself uh, referred to himself as Custos Custodians, you know, the, the custodian of the work, the, the guardian of the work. 
Um, and in fact, I, I use that word a bit, a, bit, uh, a bit flippantly, but in a way that was an important part of the theology is that they felt that they had been guided by an angelic guardian, you know, who was going to describe to them and continue to inform them as to the, the necessary preparations that they uh, felt that they were needed to, 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 to undertake. And one of them was to explain to people about the great cycle of world history. Uh, and that's where Ward's museum comes into the picture is that it was established in London as a social history museum, a very innovative, extremely successful social history museum uh, that opened in London in 1934, known as the Abbey Folk Park. So if we put all this together, we see someone with a, uh, a, uh, uh, an, uh, what they felt was an insight into the great cosmic processes of the day, uh, culminating in this urgent call for um, preparation for the, for the return of Christ to earth. You know, the atmosphere of the 1930s was very apocalyptic, um, you know, global disorder, economic collapse, you know, the rise of extremist ideologies, you know, a very apocalyptic mood in the 1930s. And Ward's kind of consciousness of all of that, I think, produced this, um, this, uh, this urgent calling, as he felt it. Um, so for me, um, that's the interesting part, is inter seeing the interconnections of all these different elements of his, uh, of his outlook uh, into a religious uh, community that's established in 1930, that has uh, Ward's museum as part of its religious work, um, but also is, is putting out a, a, a kind of a, a manifesto, if you like, about the, the imminent return of Christ to earth and the need to prepare for that. Can and, I ask you about, um, yeah. sort of touch off there, about yeah. his view on history? How, like the, the common thing we tend to hear is, you know, oh, one thing we know about history is that we don't learn from history, that, that yeah. sort of thing. What was his... Yeah idea of history? What was he saying that it was telling us or that we yeah. should know about it? That, that's a great question, David. And, and, and I think he essentially takes a cyclical view of history, if you want to think about it in theoretical terms. Um, and I think that comes through uh, partly of his interest in Eastern religion and Eastern mysticism, is this notion that civilizations rise and fall in accordance with their ethical, ethical evolution. You know, there is a process of ethical and spiritual evolution and that certain civilizations bring it to a peak but then when they lose that, um, that degree of insight or, or wisdom or morality, they then collapse and fall away. So he's very much a creature of the 19th century in that way, because he grew up in the late 19th century and he has a sort of a notion of human progress, but he also has a, mo a notion of human decline and fall, you know, which is very characteristic of that 19th century outlook. You know, all civilizations at that time were thought to have had their peak and then fall away. And of course the British, as a global empire at the end of the 19th century, they're acutely conscious that their time may well be drawing to a close in the 20th century. Um, so I think it's a really good question because it's, it's essentially an esoteric view of world history. You know, that there is an underlying meaning or a story that is driving the changes that we see on the surface. And that toward was the underlying meaning was ethical evolution, ethical and spiritual evolution. But did he ever share views on, you know, why did the Roman empire collapse? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the things that he, that he wrote about in his museum are filled with that. Uh, so when he opened the museum, it had 45,000 objects in it, which he arranged in all these different um, um, display settings in order to give the sense of the original context. So for instance, he'd have uh, uh, you know, uh, medieval uh, implements displayed in a medieval you know, cottage or a smithy, you know, sort of showing how this, this original medieval manufacturing process worked. And in doing that, he had pamphlets and booklets and guided tours explaining the meaning of his collection in order to illustrate to people the meaning of this, uh, this idea of the rise and fall of civilizations. Uh, he was really quite, quite explicit about that. And it was part of the, the popular appeal of his museum. We really need to kind of grasp that is that this was a very popular, uh, innovative, extremely successful museum. There's an enormous amount of press coverage. Uh, the Royal family donated to it. Uh, there was public um, uh, fundraising, you know, people donating and, and, and providing uh, items into the collection. And Ward was a great publicist. Uh, he seems to us a, an eccentric figure, but he's an extremely, um, he's a wonderful communicator, great sense of humour, uh, great kind of sense of theatre. Uh, and so he wore his full robes, you know, a, a red ca uh, cassock. Um, you know, he, he was by this stage, as a, as a head of his community, he was describing himself as a bishop. Um, and so he... Um, um, he wore the uh, clothes. Wore the clothes, exactly. He wore the bishops. You know, he didn't wear a mitre, but he, he certainly wore this, you know, uh, this this elaborate gear. And 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 he was also a great communicator, and and was willing to use the newspapers to get donations. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's quite an extraordinary thing. So we tend to think of him as a bit of a, you know, once we hear the story, 
we think it's an it's an an odd character off to one side, but but in fact it's the opposite. He's quite prominent. The history side of it, his interest in history in the museum. Why don't churches do that more? Like I know in Australia, you know, given the history of say Christianity and a, a lot of references, obviously, mm. to whenever you go to a church service talking about the Old Testament, why haven't they really embraced that idea of yeah, let's make every church a museum, let's make yeah. let's emphasize our link to that long history. Like I know in Europe, you know, you've got those really old churches, but yeah. in places yeah. like Australia, why haven't we done the same thing? More I, often? I guess it's I guess it's implicit in the fabric and the fittings of a, of a church building, particularly in this high church tradition that we're talking about. You know, when you think about church iconography, you think about you know statuary and and, and the elements of architecture. You know, the Gothic windows and so on. So there is an extent there that which is implicit in in church practice. But I think the difference for Ward was that he represented something we might describe as a primitive Christianity. You know, he believed in the literal truth of biblical uh, miracles um, because he himself uh, had experienced these kinds of visions as he, as he felt, and that, that, that he felt he was inspired in a similar way that the church fathers were inspired, you know, by a direct encounter with the divine. So, um, so Ward himself, even though we, again, tend to think of him through this apocalyptic Adventist lens, the other way to think about it is that it's also filled with the joy and the, um, um, you know, vivacity of early church revelation. You know, he, he believed that if, if, uh, if the spirit of God and the spirit of Christ moved through history, and now he and his community were witness to a, the second advent of that, uh, of that spirit, um, you know, this was a reason for joy and for, for you know, for enthusiasm. So he's kind of a... Um, in many ways, he has that um, that what what scholars would describe as a primitive Christianity. You know, in that in that sense of the the vivid presence of, of the divine. So, what are the the teachings? If somebody went to his church, his abbey, yeah, what are the sort of the fundamental teachings? Yeah, well, that's a really good question too, because essentially he and his community um, established in the 1930s in this environment that I've described. Uh, they were originally associated with, so I'll, I'll answer that in two ways, historically and in the present, um, because his community continues today. Um, historically, in the 1930s, they originally had a relationship with the local Anglican uh, church. So the Bishop of St Albans uh, licensed a chaplain to come to their community and to perform holy services. Uh, their chapel, uh, which was a reconstructed medieval barn, which they filled with, you know, medieval Christian artworks. Um, it was uh, consecrated by by the um, by the bishop, uh, and so the um, to begin with, uh, they had a degree of endorsement from local Anglican authorities in in North London. But then Ward was in the habit of giving sermons and delivering public kind of homilies uh, in these semi formal um, church services on Sundays. And when the bishop discovered that he was preaching the doctrine of reincarnation and starting to be quite explicit about this Adventist mission, uh, the Bishop of St Albans realised this isn't really in keeping with what mainstream Anglicanism at the time was, was, was preaching um, or, or would endorse. So there was a, a kind of a falling out with the local Anglican uh, group and that's where, or the local Anglican authorities. And that's where Ward uh, for the first time sought his own independent religious affiliation. And there's a very interesting dimension to all of this. It's very hard to kind of encapsulate, but there's a movement which in the US today is called the Independent Sacramental Movement. And it deals with bishops who claim a succession of ordination from one bishop to another, going back very deep into the church's history. Um, and they're often associated with old Catholic movements and with Catholic dissident movements who also retain a sense of uh, holy ordination from one bishop to the next. So the important thing here is the office is passed from one bishop to the next, and it doesn't necessarily need to have any kind of church affiliation or church recognition because the office itself is seen as a holy office going right back to the church fathers and the apostles. Um, but the key thing too is that it doesn't actually need a congregation or a, or a permanent you know, uh, uh, basis in a church. It's, it's literally a line of succession in the office. So Ward was consecrated a bishop in the Orthodox Catholic Church of England uh, which was one of these threads, and there's many hundreds of them, these threads of different old Catholic and independent um, um, sacramental uh, lines of succession. Um, there's a really amazing book, if anyone wants to look it up, uh, called Bishops at Large, uh, 
and it's published by uh, written by Peter Anson, published in the 1960s, and you'll you'll find versions of it online. It's an absolutely fascinating story of this ecclesiastical underworld uh, um, that's developing in kind of dissident Catholic groups, uh, including groups in 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 India, in French speaking parts of Canada, in the United States, and in, and ultimately in Britain. Um, and so Ward is is consecrated a bishop within this tradition, and so he and his community. Um, see themselves as an abbey, a confraternity of the kingdom of Christ, associated with the church uh, known as the Orthodox Catholic Church, because it presented to the world the idea that they reunified Catholicism with Orthodoxy. Yeah. You know, the Great Schism of 1053, <laughs> this was now a realignment between those two very different tra traditions. So if um, a Catholic went in there to that service, yeah. Would it be familiar enough? They, would they have communion, Bible readings? Uh, yeah, in terms of the overall pattern of the service, yes. Um, and, and like you say, there are kind of elements of the liturgy that are um, familiar, but there are some things that would be unfamiliar and quite radical, including uh, active uh, presentation of the theme of reincarnation. Um, that's a feature of, of their prayer book and of their, of their hymns and, and, and of the uh, invocation of the Holy Spirit. Um, but also the notion that there are that there is a feminine nature of God. So rather than Father the Son, Father the uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, it's God the Mother, God the Father, and God the Son. Mm -hmm. So the the Holy Spirit is imagined in a feminine form. Was that um, reflected in their leadership? Did they have uh, female preachers and that sort of thing? Yes, they did. Um, John Wood, because as, a, as, a, as essentially a, a, a monastic community, um, they took vows and they had uh, roles within that community. Um, many of them were married couples when they joined the community, so they took typical traditional vows of, of obedience. Sort of, of, sorry, that's my phone. That's uh, of obedience and, um, and and poverty and mutual um, uh, collection of, of goods and so on. But there was no expectation that there were vows of chastity because, then, in fact, many of the people in the community were married. Uh -huh. um, and when Ward died in 1949, his wife took over as Reverend Mother of the community. And in fact, today there is two leaders of the community, Father George. Um, uh, and Sister Veronica. And with their sort of teaching on charity or helping people, is, is that a prominent part of the, the order? Do they have any sort of specific things you, you know, you have to do volunteering um, work, you have to give to the yeah. people? They themselves um, demonstrated those virtues. Um, they were, you know, during the war, for instance, they, um, uh, this, the, the, the Abbey was registered as a place of worship for the, in, in the British, uh, for the British um, um, Department of Labor during the war, uh, which meant that they were reserved from conscription and they were reserved from you know, working in munitions factories. But nevertheless, they, they continued to, um, you know, to do voluntary work in, in, the, in the region of North London. Uh, for instance, they were, they were great, um, bearing in mind, it's only a small group of people. It's only 12, 12 to 14 members of the Abbey at this time. Um, they'd do you know, sewing and needlework, uh, and they would sort of donate that to local, you know, to local work, uh, local charities, and so on. What, what the really interesting thing about it, I think, uh, in the broader term, is that when the community leaves London in 1946, um, there is this strong Adventist kind of quality, and it is in many ways a um, a tight uh, and introspective, you know, uh, group. Um, coming to Australia in 1965, and there's a whole story about that transition. Um, they were originally arrived as a tight introspective group, but they've now become very much a feature of the local community. Um, they are uh, active through the museum, of course. They have the festival, which is a major visitor attraction in the area around Kabulcha. They also have uh, a school, you know, St Michael's College, uh, which is a very successful primary school, uh, and they are involved in, you know, um, a network of, of local communities and local kind of uh, fundraising and services and so on. Mm -hmm. So it's really a story from transition from outsiders to insiders that's the kind of the aspect that i'm interested in uh in the, in the life of the community itself do we know if young people because you know there's always discussions now in churches oh we're losing young people young people aren't interested for them did they ever attract a lot of young people whether earlier on or now or yeah you know, again, we don't this, know. this is what i find really interesting is that in the 1930s pretty much all the members that joined were young couples uh often teachers uh, and if they were joined as individuals, often they then developed relationships within the community and were married. So there's three or four families, you know, the Balls, the Cuffs, the Chamberlains, um, who joined Ward. And when they joined them, they either had young children or they had children who were then brought up in the community. 
Um, and when I first started researching them, of course, the question here is, you know, at what point does a um, insular Adventist neo-medieval religious community, at what point do you start to describe it in fact as a religious cult rather than as a religious community? You know, and that's a real question that I had to address in my research and my interpretation early on. And I think- What's the to, answer? And the answer is no. The answer is no, I don't see them as a cult. Uh, certainly not during Ward's period. Um, because Ward himself was an idealist and the people who came to him were also idealists. And there was an atmosphere, as far as I can absolutely establish through the research, there was an absolute, uh, there was an atmosphere of respect and of courtesy and of tolerance, not tolerance, that's not the right word, uh, egalitarian, I guess, mm -hmm. is the thing, you know, that they're, they're, they're actually uh, mutually respectful. And Ward does not present, even though he's an idealist and an enthusiast, he does not present to me in the historical evidence as someone who was controlling his, his followers, his members. And that's an important element, you know, the abuse of, of leadership roles and the abuse of, of, of charismatic, charismatic leadership in the cult environment. That's an important theme. So Ward was certainly an idealist and was certainly an enthusiast. Um, and I think after his death, the community became more introspective, more insular. And I think it started to develop cult-like tendencies at that time. Mm -hmm. You know, I think when they were living in Cyprus, uh, it was very difficult. They were essentially 12 English people living on a farm in Cyprus, trying to make a living. Uh, trying to earn um, uh, food and nutrition from the land, you know, sort of counting the eggs and, and, and you know, taking the pigs to market and, and, you know, literally trying to survive from one week to the next as self-sufficient community. After Ward's death, they became a very insular, um, in, in, in some ways, quite paranoid kind of, kind of organisation. Um, but when they came to Australia, the next generation starts to come through and there's an increased openness. You know, there's an increased openness about, about the community. And if you visit them today, you'll discover um, welcome, uh, welcoming, uh, loving, talented people, you know, who are, who are enthusiastic about uh, not just the world of the, of the church, but also the world of the, um, uh, of, the, of the museum and how it can be used as a kind of a community resource for, for education and recreation. So in the issue about, oh, sorry, 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 I was just gonna, the, fi the final thing, I was just gonna say the issue about young people is, is a good one though, because they don't actively recruit and as a result, the membership is of, of the community that's there today is, is aging. Uh, there are only a handful of people now living on site in the community, but they do have a second and third order of the, of the community who have always lived outside in the, in the community more broadly. Mm -hmm. So there's a small number at the Abbey, but with connections out into them. Did they, were they ever big on evangelising to try to recruit people or it's always been a part of their tradition to kind of not really be that active to try to get you to come and join? Yeah, it was certainly a theme in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, not really a theme in, in Cyprus for obvious reasons. You know, this is at a time when uh, Cyprus was sliding towards civil war and it was still a, an English colony at that stage, a British colony. Um, coming to Australia, they were essentially, it was about survival and uh, uh, you know, reproducing, you know, what, what they had. Um, at, but at a time when the Adventist message that had been so strong in the 1930s and 1940s was, was no longer uh, such a strong feature. So in a way, there's a kind of a multi-faith spirituality element to, to the work of the Abbey today. And they do, in fact, have a multi-faith um, forum established at the, uh, at the Abbey that opened two or three years ago. Um, where they meet regularly across different faith traditions in that, in that region. Some might describe it as a bit of a new age spirituality that's also a theme amongst the second and third generation of members. Um, they don't wear the formal clothing so much. They don't insist on um, explicit you know, doctrine and, and, and dogma so much. It's a much more welcoming uh, sort of view of the world, I think, and a much more open and um, uh, uh, flexible view of the world. So what um, underpins the multi-faith side of it you know like some people are resistant to the idea of multi-faith yeah. dialogue what what for them what underpins it what makes them so well, happy yeah to yeah well it goes right back to john ward in in along with the adventist elements in many ways john ward is very similar to the theosophists of the same day you know theosophy at the end of the 19th century was about discovering universal consistencies and similarities between different world traditions so finding christian teaching on the one hand and hindu uh, you know, mysticism on the other and finding a kind of a common theme, you know, around the, the nature of the human existence, the nature of the soul, uh, you know, the ethical uh, expectations for doing good and avoiding evil, um, you know, notions of the progression of the soul into the afterlife. You know, there are things that are, that are, that are universal, 
Um, and theosophy, like the Baha'i movement of modern times, you know, theosophy at the end of the 19th century saw this as being a great underlying truth about human existence, a spiritual truth. And so that was very much in Ward's thinking. Even though he himself wasn't a theosophist, a lot of his uh, positions were very similar to what theosophy had to say. And so the followers in Ward's tradition, that the members of the community today, uh, are quite open to that notion that all great traditions of, you know, of, of, of all great faith traditions of the world have a version of the divine, you know, they have a, a, a version of, of, uh, of spiritual reality communicated through their teachings. Um, and, and they're quite happy, you know, as indeed Ward was, to talk about the, um, uh, the unifying message across different religious traditions. And has there been much movement sort of within the movement? Do people leave a lot, new, new people come in, or is it kind of stays the same? Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's a community rather than a movement, I think is the best way to think about it. And it's a community of people who've known each other all their lives. And as I say, they're very warm, very welcoming, very generous people, very hospitable. Um, and Father George, who's the current uh, head of the, of, the, of the order of the community, uh, that's Father George Cuff, um, is very, um, you know, very happy to talk and, and to discuss, you know, questions of, of, of faith and the, um, um, the, the particular positions taken by the community uh, over time. So um, I guess, I guess that's, the, that's the key thing. Um, the movement isn't so much people coming and going, the movement so sorry, the, 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 the pattern isn't so much a, a question of people coming and going. It's more a question of a small community of people who are occasionally reinforced. And then as people pass away, if you reach the end of their life cycle, you know, the, the numbers have depleted, you know. So, so that they are looking at their long-term future in terms of what's sustainable for the community as a church uh, and as a church community. Um, and they're starting to think, well, what does happen when, you know, when, when the generations have passed and, and there's now no longer anyone uh, to carry it forward. Given their views on sort of history and how they view history and things happening in history, does that shape their views on what's going to happen to them? What should happen to them? Uh, as a community, I think I think embracing the multi-faith potential of the moment is is really their is really their emphasis. Um, there's a current kind of movement in Australian life uh, around ideas of spirituality and well-being and you know present-mindedness and and, and so on. Um, and I think they're certainly aware that that more Kind of therapeutic emphasis in in religious life is is potentially uh, a, a meeting place across different traditions. So there is a master planning exercise going on at the moment. You know the the, the uh, about the future of the abbey. Um, that's something that's occurring as an internal discussion. You know within the community, um, but it's also reflected in the long term relationship with the abbey museum. In that the abbey museum was originally established using the uh, material and the resources that Ward had built up. You know the collection. Um, but it's now very much functioning as, a, as an independent um, aspect of the, of the community. Uh, mm -hmm. It has a very strong volunteer based, not all members of, those, of that, that volunteer base are from the community. It comes in from the, from the, the, the wider uh, mm -hmm. society around. Um, but yeah, that whole question about the long-term uh, uh, outlook is, is a good one. I think is, is an important one for them and, and a, a, good, a good question for you to, to, to explore because um, in, in a spiritual sense, they, they, they have a faith, you know, um, and they have a sense of, well, this is, uh, you know, what our role is, and this is what we as individuals contribute to that role, you know, in, in terms of the long-term future of the organisation and the community itself, that's, that's another question. Yeah, it just makes me think of, because if, if they talk about history, about, you know, every empire goes away, every time, yeah. and, you know, this yeah. is, do we view that kind of, well, you know, every church community will at some point go away, and that's not necessarily, that's a bad that's thing, right. it's just life. It's and it made me think of in, in philanthropy, you know, some foundations will put themselves out of business and others will mm. preserve forever. Mm. Yeah. Um, thinking that some yeah. say, oh, no, you don't need to be around forever. In fact, yeah. you're better off just being sort of time limited. Yeah. Well, I think, I think looking at it as a historian, um, one thing that we see really clearly is that that Adventist rhetoric that was such a powerful element in the 1930s and 1940s, you know, the imminent return of Christ, um, that is still part of their... Of their framework, you know, you you find that in in the uh, in the in the liturgy and the, the church practices, but it's no longer seen in quite such urgent psychological terms as perhaps it was in the 1930s. You know, it's it's much more of a broader view of, of what the cosmic process is. So, what was it like when they came to Caboolture? And for those who may watch this who aren't from Queensland, can you tell us what Caboolture is like and yeah. what it was like for them when they got here? Yeah, well, Caboolture is to the north of Brisbane on the on the coast road, uh, and it's also 
uh, as the highway goes north, it's through a, what was originally a dairy area. So it's small farms, uh, grazing farms for dairy cattle. And then there's a turn off where you go towards Bribey Island, um, uh, which is a sand island off the coast there. And it was actually the first beach you get to when you go north of Brisbane was at Bribey Island. So in the 1950s and 1960s, people used to do day trips to the beach. They'd either go to the Gold Coast to the south or they'd go up to Bribey Island to the north. Um, and so it's a pretty quiet place. Um, it's now more of an outer suburban area of, of metropolitan Brisbane, um, you know, with a lot of new housing, you know, young families, a bit of light industry, but certainly a lot of housing estates. Um, it's not the place where you'd expect to find, first of all, a medieval <laughs> community, uh, and secondly, a, a, a collection of medieval antiquities and, and, and kind of global, you know, world civilization antiquities. Uh, that really is quite an amazing collection. The Abbey Museum, if you, if you go online, have a look simply for the Abbey Museum of Art and Archaeology. And the collection is valued at tens of millions of dollars. It really oh. is an extraordinary collection of artifacts. It's stained glass in their church. Um, it's yeah. it's um, ceramics, it's artworks, it's weaponry, um, it's textiles. You know, it's, it's just an amazing collection. It's like being in a corner of the British Museum. It really is. It's like a small collection, but an extremely... Um, you know, vivid collection of, of really interesting artifacts. And when you think about it, when they left London to go to Cyprus to come to Australia, the material they collected, they sold a lot of it at that time. Uh, and the stuff that they kept tended to be the small objects that they could carry with them, you know, in packing cases, which is where they stayed for a long time before being opened up again in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. And when they came to Kabulcha, was there, were they accepted? Was what was this group of people? Yeah, yeah. My current research is exploring that. Actually, we're doing a, an entry. Uh, I'm writing an entry for our project on the Queensland Atlas of Religion, which is a new um, University of Queensland-led project with ARC funding uh, to develop a, a public reference website that explores religious diversity in Queensland today and historically through a series of kind of case studies and examples of, of community life uh, places and, and, um, and activities that kind of encapsulate different elements of this story. So I'm, I'm writing on the Abbey community and I'm, I'm writing an entry on, on their presence in that, in that landscape of Kabulcha uh, since the 1960s, uh, because the church itself, you know, with its gardens around and its stained glass window, it's a beautiful place just for meditation, you know, just for people to go. There's services there, there's weddings. Of course, they have weekly services through the community, um, but it is a beautiful little church. And the uh, initial response, as, you, as you're asking from the, uh, the local residents at, at Kabulcha is that this was a very strange phenomenon when a group of English religious eccentrics, and I don't think that's unfair to describe them as that, um, when a group of, of English, uh, you know, religious eccentrics arrive in a, a place like Kabulcha, having bought a dairy farm and start to build a church uh, and then start to, um, you know, to get involved in the local community. And one of the ways that, that um, those assumptions and barriers were broken down was that you know, they proved themselves very community minded. Uh, they established the first football club in Caboolture in the 1960s, you know, soccer uh, hadn't been a feature of local life, but they're of course English. So, you know, the, the teenagers amongst them all played soccer. Um, and, and in other ways, you know, uh, being involved in not just giving local services, but also marriages and, and, and you know, celebrating weddings uh, and also um, uh, administering um, holy sacraments for people that, you know, um, you know, on the, on the verge of, of passing away, um, you know, that, that often at that crisis point in someone's life, they feel the need for uh, a blessing. You know, they feel the need for the presence of, of a religious um, person, a religious influence, you know, at this time in their life. And because the community made no expectations about, well, you have to be, a, you know, um, uh, um, you know, baptized or confirmed, or you have to be a member of our communion before we'll, we'll do that. They were more than willing to provide that kind of uh, care and um, um, you know assistance to people at that stage of their lives too, and that and I think that went a long way to kind of building up a bit of an understanding of of the generosity of spirit that's there in the community, and that's mm -hmm. certainly something that I've seen. And the museum, I imagine, brought some people in. Yes, yes. Well, it opened in the nineteen eighties. Uh, it was funded with a grant uh, from the Utah Foundation. And there was some, you know, state government and Queensland Museum support in establishing that because it's not easy to build a museum, you know, as a building from scratch and then to staff it and to have exhibitions and, and so on. Um, so, yes, it's, I think it's an amazing success story. You know, the, the fact that this uh, collection was in boxes for, for decades and then Michael Strong and other members of the community 
um, were able to kind of pull it together as a formal exhibition, as a formal museum, to gain the funding to build the, you know, the building itself, uh, and then to start to run this, um, not just exhibitions, but also uh, they do uh, outreach work to schools. So they do archeological digs and uh, work on ancient Egypt. You know, they have class groups coming through the museum um, and doing mock digs. Um, they've got, you know, medieval manuscripts. And so they've got, you know, primary school students looking directly at medieval manuscripts. That's amazing. <laughs> That's just you know, quite extraordinary that you can bring 10 year olds and, and see the actual manuscripts there. Um, and then well, we're both in Brisbane and we don't have that here. No, that's right. That's right. Yeah, this is not something that's a feature. Um, and then, of course, the, the festival, you know, the tournament started 32 years ago and uh, is, is an amazing thing. It's Australia's largest medieval reenactment event. Uh, it brings reenactors from all over the country. Uh, and there's, you know, tournaments and kind of chivalric displays and, um, you know, hunting and, you know, archery and, you know, there's a feast, you know, uh, medieval feast uh, as part of the whole event. So, yeah, it's it's really quite extraordinary that such a renaissance, such a cultural flowering associated with um, with this collection and with this community has occurred in a place like Caboolture, which, as I say, is, is um, you know, is, is otherwise a, a quite a practical, pragmatic sort of a place. Mm -hmm. And you've talked a bit about the sort of the museum and the exhibits. What are some of the ones that you like? You mentioned the medieval manuscripts. Is, is there some exhibits that it's a must see? Yeah, well, because I, I originally started as a 19th century British historian, um, and I think... As you do. Yeah, <laughs> I think what's interesting is, uh, is that the way the exhibitions are presented follow a very traditional, progressive and evolutionary view of world history. You know, as we know, that was kind of John Ward's outlook. Uh, and it's also the way in which many people think about world history that it's that it's a progressive story of technological development and increasing sophistication so you start with crude tools and over time those tools become more sophisticated you know so that's the kind of thinking that comes through in the 19th century view of of, of world history and it's certainly there in john ward and in a way they've echoed that in the way the exhibition is displayed so along with uh, individual items in the collection um You've also got the way that they're presented as part of this evolutionary, in a way, teleological story of human growth and development. And that in itself, I think, is, is interesting. But specific items, I mean, they've got things, Ward was a great um, communicator uh, and a great uh, enthusiast who conveyed his enthusiasm for the subject, you know, to visitors. Um, and so he often used things like tools or, um, uh, you know, lanterns or lamps. Uh, and as, rather than just sort of showing you the object, he would find a way to present it in its original context. So the lamp with the oil set up on a desk, the way a Roman oh. schoolboy would have a lamp with the oil and the paper and his, you know, um, um, stylus, mm -hmm. you know, so on a, on a wax plate rather than paper. Um, and so that's the thing about what Ward had in London in the 1930s was this idea about presenting the artifacts in a um, kind of an immersive environment where you got in, imm you're immersed into the original setting. And they do that to a certain extent at the, at the Abbey Museum today. Uh, it's not entirely built on those uh, folk park principles, but there are parts of the collection where they have, for instance, a medieval monk, you know, a mannequin um, of a monk with a stained glass window, you know, with a quill sort of, you know, doing what monks do, yeah, <laughs> trans right. transcribing the, um, you know, the, the manuscript. So individual items, there's, there's things from, um, from uh, Asian and Persian civilizations, you know, kind of ornate tiles. Uh, there's, um, you know, Japanese edgeware, there's, you know, Japanese swords, um, there's medieval armor. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, like, it's like a treasure trove and it's They're not, not replicas, the actual, no, actual armor. ones. Yeah, actual ones. There's, um, there's foot greaves. So there's a, it's one of, it's, it, again, it's, it's always hard to pin this stuff down because a lot of stuff is in private hands. But if you look around the great museums of the world, there's not many examples of Greek armor still in existence. They have Greek greaves that were like cricket pads for, for Greek soldiers. You know, if you imagine a, a um, what are they called, a hoplite, a Greek, a Greek hoplite with those, you know, protections for their shins. Well, there's examples of that in the, in the Abbey Museum collection uh, that, you know, very rare in global terms. You yeah, it's amazing. Terms. So it's quite uh, extraordinary. What about the school? You said they run a school? Yes, they do. St. Michael's College uh, and Sister Veronica, who's the head of the of the community, uh, along with Father George, uh, she's the principal of that school. Uh, and it's essentially a, a, an independent uh, primary school. 
Uh, I don't know the exact enrollments, but it's somewhere around three or 400 students, you know, at that school, the number of classes, you know, at all levels. Uh, it's got a very good reputation on the North Coast uh, in uh, up around Caboolture and Moreton Bay. Uh, and uh, it's certainly grown and it's got, you know, grounds attached to the Abbey community. Um, and uh, it's, yeah, it's a very successful school. I was going to say, it's amazing that they have the, the school, mm. and the museum, yeah, and, and, and that history. Now, you mentioned that you started is it 19th century British history. Yeah. What was, for, for you, when you started studying that history, any big surprises, any historical events that you think haven't got enough attention or should get attention? Or Yeah, well, it's funny you should say that because you mentioned philanthropy before. Um, and one of my... Uh, early interests. I mean, I, I started off undergraduate, you know, studying British history with uh, an emphasis on Victorian studies. So literature and culture, um, you know, the work of the Victorian poets and architects and so on. So it was the atmosphere of the 19th century that really got me into that style of cultural history. And when I focused on my PhD research, I focused on London and I was looking at social work and social reform in London in the 1880s and 1890s. And I actually ended up writing about a group of cultural philanthropists. So people who were social workers who believed in the gift of culture, like providing uh, education, uh, literacy, music, um, poetry, um, ballroom dancing, Shakespeare, uh, et cetera, to the poor. So this isn't something that's being discussed in an abstract sense as something that occurs in the great institutions of the time. This is actually something that people are doing in terms of everyday local social work. So a group of social workers who would go into the slums of the East End, where the Jack the Ripper murders are happening, you know, the worst slums in London, and they would set up a little hall where they could give Shakespeare reading classes and ballroom dancing classes and, um, you know, uh, adult education. It seems a an, an complete anomaly uh, to our assumptions of that, of that period. And the historians who have written about it tend to emphasise this as a class-driven idea that this is the middle class trying to inculcate middle class values amongst the poor. And I see it very differently. I, I wrote a book and my PhD was published as a book about four years ago. Uh, it took a long time to turn from a thesis into a book. <laughs> um, but, but essentially argued that this is the beginnings of what we see today as uh, an expectation that literacy is universal and our, our ability to participate in culture and education and opportunities of the mind is actually a right of, of citizenship. It's not something that belongs just to the rich or just to the wealthy or just to those. So we now have a system that expects that governments will invest in culture, that they'll maintain art galleries, they'll maintain theatres and libraries, they'll subsidise, you know, opera companies and so on. And my argument is that this whole notion that the arts are of universal benefit uh, in terms of, you know, British and Australian life, certainly, um, my argument is that that whole um, ethos derives from these experiments that were being made in the 1880s and 1890s, because this sort of emphasis on public access to culture was started by these philanthropists as a voluntary thing, but was then taken up within 10 years by the London County Council. And it's the first local government in Britain to properly invest in galleries, libraries, museums, archives, and so on, you know, as a way of developing universal access to what we might describe as culture. Prior to that, it had been entirely, you know, uh, the benefit of the rich or the, the, the opportunity of the, of the rich. And the views that we have of, say, 19th century London, you know, the, the kids in chimneys and things like that, how, how accurate is that view? Oh, pretty accurate. I mean, they were pretty grim. Um, you know, the whole Dickensian idea of, you know, crumbling slums and, and people in desperate poverty, you know, people living in misery, and squalor, that's certainly a case, you know, certainly the case. And in the 1880s and 1890s, there was the first generation of proper slum clearances where they were going into these, you know, appalling, atrocious neighbourhoods uh, and seeking to demolish the housing and, and introduce new improved housing. Um, so that's why this kind of emphasis on art and literature and culture at the time is a bit unexpected because most people are facing much more pragmatic challenges, you know, unemployment, um, you know, widespread alcoholism, uh, family collapse, um, you know, uh, it was a very miserable place, you know, those, those, those neighbourhoods of, of, of London. And, and the fact that there is the beginnings of a reform agenda, not just about slum clearance, but also about welfare provision, old age pensions, uh, unemployment insurance and, and benefits, that's all coming out of that context of trying to do something about these appalling urban conditions. And is there other things about that time that you liked? When you when you focus on your on your research, yeah, I think um, I mean 
my, my father was a teacher and was also an education officer in the army. So in a way, that whole story of uh, Britain on the world stage, you know, as a Britain as an imperial power uh, and the British Empire was something I was always interested in as a, as a younger person. But I think that now manifests as an interest in uh, colonialism in, the, in, in, in terms of Britain's role on the world stage, because Australia, after all, is a settler society that comes out of, you know, the British colonial experience. So at UQ now, I teach a course, Britain, Empire and the World, which starts with uh, the early 17th century and goes through to the mid 20th century. And it's essentially a history of the British Empire. Um, and that tallies in with a bunch of, you know, kind of long standing interests I've had. Uh, with the nature of Britain's presence on the, on, the, on the world stage. I'm not by any means an Anglophile. You know, I'm, in many ways, I'm very proud to be Australian and that comes with a healthy dose of kind of anti-British attitudes. I'm not an Anglophile, but I do find, you know, Britain an extraordinary kind of global phenomenon that this small, obscure, um, you know, island nation off the coast of Europe develops into a global empire. Literally, it's literally a global empire. That's the, the first, the first genuinely global empire. So I think Ricky Gervais, you know, makes the joke, you know, whenever he's talking to an American audience, he says, oh, I'm from Britain. We used to run the world before you did. You know, <laughs> the British used to run the world. And now the Americans like to think that they do. Do we know the views of, of the average English person during that sort of colonial era? Were they yeah. all for it? Did they view it in the same way we view it now? Yeah, there's a big debate about that in the literature, um, that there was an assumption for many years that the British were what, the historian John Seeley called absent-minded imperialists. You know, they kind of did it accidentally, you know, that they were focused on commercial opportunities. They were focused on, um, you know, global shipping and, um, you know, and in time they had this kind of global military presence. You know, India was obviously very important to them. If you see this long, slow buildup of the British presence across the globe, it always seems to be in response to small, local, immediate opportunities rather than as part of a big grand plan. You know, it's not like they were an imperialist power from the start, but they were a rapidly, well, they were an opportunistic power that were rapidly expanding with different opportunities. And that meant an Atlantic empire in the 18th century, and then increasingly an Asian empire in the 19th century, and then an African empire at the end of the 19th century. Uh, and Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and South Africa are all settler colonies that develop as part of that. So the question of working out how the British thought about their empire is, is a good one. Um, and there was used to be this idea that it was it all came about as a matter of accident. And then a historian, and, and therefore they didn't really think that much about it. They weren't really kind of invested in it emotionally. But then a historian by the name of John Mackenzie in the 1980s and 1990s has really revised that with a whole swathe of research about how infused British life was, particularly in the late 19th century, with imperialist... Um, uh, ideas with imperialist values, uh, with popular imperialist sentiments, um, and also with a kind of daily reality, you know, that their tea came from Sri Lanka, you know, mm -hmm. and, and the, the, you know, the ivory that was in their pianos came from Africa, you know, so this whole notion that it was an empire of commodities, and that Britain was at the centre of it. You know, that was a really powerful idea in the 19th century. But I think Mackenzie, in a way, overstates the argument. I, I, I think he does. I think there is a bit to say that the British were always opportunists, and that brought a lot of colonial opportunities, but they weren't naturally imperialistic, you know, in an intuitive kind of instinctive way. I think, I think they always kept that idea of empire a little bit at, at arm's distance in terms of how they thought about their role in the world. They were happy to benefit from it from a, for a long period of time, and they became acutely patriotic about it at the end of the 19th century, but then they gave it away really quite quickly and without a lot of regret, you know, in the mid 20th century, they became enthusiastic decolonizers. Mm -hmm. at the end of uh, Empire in India in 1947. Now, we, we've talked about history, and I won't hold you up too, too much. No, you're more. Right. Um, we talked about history in museums. I must ask you about the British Museum. Now, that is sometimes criticised, shall we say, about the things that they have there, and should they return those things? Yeah. That there? What's your view on that as a historian? Yeah, it's a good one. I, I think the argument for repatriation is very strong. Um, I do think that those items were collected in the interests of the British colonising power and to the long-term benefit of Britain as a colonising power in conditions of gross uh, inequality of, of, of power in the moment, you know? So, you know, the, the British uh, took the Elgin marbles um, and, and literally, you know, uh, 
chiseled them off the building, literally vandalized them to take them away, to take them back to the Museum of London at a time when civic order was collapsing in, in what we now know of as Greece, you know, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, uh, civil war and, and so on. Um, now that there is in many cases, no longer a question of civil order and, and threat to the items, you know, back where they came from, I think there is a very strong case to say that it would be an extremely generous act you know, demonstrating a magnanimity, what's the word, magnanimity? You're of asking the wrong person. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> Very magnanimous gesture yeah. uh, if, if the British government and if the British people were to, to then seek to return them. I can't see that happening, though, because, you know, ownership is 90% of the law, mm -hmm. uh, and this is still part of the reason why London thinks of itself as a global destination. It's those cultural institutions in London that really... Uh, you know, still contribute an enormous amount to British prestige. Oh, I see. So that's why they hang on to it. Instead of saying, look, we've had it for ages, you can have it, what, what do we care? It's yeah. actually, oh, like, it's, oh, I don't know, this is a good thing. This is a good marketing. Still, still buttresses their prestige as a global yeah. as a global epicentre. But I, but I think the arguments for repatriation are getting stronger. I don't think it helps if they're, if they're passionate and emotive, you know, which they often are in the service of nationalism. Um, you know, that these items belong in their home soil mm -hmm. and, you know, and so on. Because there is a countervailing argument to say that, at different times in history, they were threatened and you know, the custodianship, you know, in this case by the British, uh, preserved them in, in the long term. There is, there is something to that. Um, but I, I think, um, you know, we've got a really tangible example of that at the moment with the uh, Afghanistan antiquities in Kabul uh, and the, the Taliban. Uh, you know, if you follow the detail of that, it's extraordinary. The collections in the National Museum at Kabul uh, were hidden by curators in the basement peril to their own lives uh, during the first period of the Taliban government, when after 2003, uh, the new government was installed, they then put those, brought those uh, immensely valuable items out on display uh, in Kabul, but also took them around the world as a, um, as a global exhibition. And it came to Queensland and, you know, Queensland Museum had a, an exhibition from Afghanistan uh, of the treasures of the Silk Road, mm -hmm. you know, amazing golden artifacts that had been hidden from the Taliban. Now those, items all went back to the museum in Kabul. And of course, we now know with the return of the Taliban, you know, who knows what the story is now. So these are volatile parts of the world, um, but that doesn't give automatic right for possession of these world heritage artifacts in, in the epicenters of the old world empires, like London, Paris, New York. Well, thanks so much for this. It was a fascinating talk. Thank you for spending the time doing it. For those who are going to watch this, if you're saying to yourself, why doesn't David ask him this question or that question, like good questions, you can still ask those questions. Just get in contact with the Australian Student Christian Movement and we'll forward it on to the professor who can then answer it uh, for you. So thank yeah. you again. Thanks, David. I really appreciate the, the, the opportunity. It's great to talk to you.